started, um, we're going to get right into it today because um, for those of you that are in steel, uh, I have to end class a little early today with steel because we have a college-wide meeting, so uh, I'm just going to sort of get right into it. Um, real quick, so you all have a homework assignment due today. I am collecting them up here. If you have not turned that in, go ahead and do so. Um, you have homework two that has been posted on uh, Blackboard. Okay, it's not due until February third. Um, so if you've got a little bit of time, but it is a larger assignment. There's five problems on that assignment. It, it's got a lot going on with it. So the way that, like after today, you'll definitely be able to do problem one. You'll probably be able to attack problem two. My advice with that assignment is to attack it in stages. Don't wait until Sunday at 11 p.m. to start it. You don't. Uh, that's going to be, be a, 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 a late night. Um, with that, I'm just going to jump right into it. We're going to continue our discussion of flexural behavior, uh, specifically looking at uh, going back to cracking moments, but then starting to uh, ask the question, well, what happens past the cracking moment? And then after that, we'll discuss ultimate capacity. Um, so let me sort of very briefly recap um, where we left off. So we were looking at... Um, a fairly basic structure. Um, so we 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 talked about loads. We're sort of we're going to move past loads, and we we started talking about a, a basic uh, structure. So simply supported being subjected to a uniformly distributed load. By and large, the simplest uh, 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 loading scenario that we deal with as civil engineers. Period. Um, now, what we are sort of conceptually doing for the next uh, few days or few lectures is we're going to visualize this beam in our head and start to ramp up the load uh, 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 and, you know, you know, increasingly. And we're going to start looking at what happens to this beam as we start increasing the load. So our stage one behavior is when the beam is uncracked. So this is when the load is really, really light. There's not a lot of force on it. Uh, and it behaves like any other beam. Uh, uh, the tensile uh, stresses are less than the modulus of rupture. So you know, you bend it, the top's in compression, bottom's in tension. Uh, and it will continue to behave this way until you exceed or reach the cracking moment. In other words, the cracking moment is when the stresses in the bottom fibers of the beam, the extreme tensiles, uh, uh, the extreme fiber or in the tensile region, it doesn't have to be the bottom. Uh, if you're bending over up here, it could be a negative bending or something like that, and so the top would be in tension. But whenever the extreme tensile fiber reaches the modulus of rupture, that's when um, uh, the, the beam will crack, okay? So um, it's a function of the modulus of rupture, the moment of inertia, and your extreme fiber distance. And we started looking at this example. We didn't quite uh, get too far into it, um, but we have a beam that's subjected to a, a, a moment of 25 foot tips. We have normal weight, uh, 4,000 PSI concrete, and then we have um, uh, the dimensions that we're seeing here, um, and we want to determine uh, uh, its behavior. What I'm actually going to do first is I'm going to determine the cracking moment first because that's kind of the new stuff uh, with us. And so we're going to look at the cracking moment first, then we'll start making some observations about this beam's behavior. Okay? So let me go back to the, uh, the calculations. So here's the problem. Uh, we had uh, computed the gross moment of inertia, BH cubed over 12, and we had computed the extreme fiber distance in tension, which is just H over 2. Now, this beam had a really simple moment of inertia and a really simple extreme fiber distance because the cross section is simple. It's just a rectangle. Okay? The next problem, we're going to have a T-beam, and it's, I don't want to say it's going to get more complicated, but it's going to get a lot more involved. Uh, with the computation of your section properties. And so that the next problem that we do is really going to serve just as a review of how to compute centroids and moments of inertia, because all that stuff is going to be very important. Now, we're going to do the cracking moment first, and you'll see why here in a second. But in order to determine the cracking moment, I need a gross moment of inertia, an extreme fiber distance, and I need a modulus of rupture. Okay? So let's go ahead and compute the modulus of rupture. <coughs> So that's FR equals, anybody remember what that formula was from our notes last time? 7.5 lambda square root of F prime. FC prime. Okay, exactly right. So 7.5 times lambda times the square root of FC prime. So naturally that's, that begs the question, what's lambda and what's FC prime? So let's deal with lambda first. Remember, lambda is a factor that accounts for lightweight aggregates. 
99 times out of 100, unless you are told, bless you, unless you are told what lambda is, lambda is 1. Because in most, I mean, normal weight concrete is normal weight. So in normal scenarios, lambda is 1. So in this instance, we're going to have 7.5 times 1.0. Now, in this problem, we have uh, four, uh, 4 KSI concrete, or 4,000 PSI concrete. So, is this right? Why? What's the deal with the units? Remind me. You put in PSI, and it comes out something specific. Comes, you put in PSI, <laughs> you get out PSI. That's good. I like that Put in PSI, get out PSI. So whenever you see a square root of FC prime, put in PSI, and you get out PSI. Again, the units don't quite work out, uh, but again, we're dealing with empirical relationships. Somebody help me out. What is um, 7.5 times 1 times square root of 4,000? I'm actually going to take this number and write it on the board just so we sort of have it as a reference. Four seventy four. We'll say four seventy four point three. We don't have to get super super uh, precise, but do I have a second on that value? Yes. And again, put in psi, get out psi. Okay. So I have a modulus of rupture. I have an extreme fiber distance and a gross moment of inertia. So now we can compute the cracking moment. So the cracking moment. That's MCR is FR IG over YT. And again, all that is is just sigma equals MY over I, your basic bending stress formula from engineering 216 and just solving for moment. And your stress is just FR. So I'm going to plug this in. So FR is 474.3. Again, use your pencil or pen, write the little P, the little S, I, put the dot on top of the I, and actually write out your units. It's incredibly important. And you'll see why here in a second. Moment of inertia is 5832 inches to the fourth. And then our YT is 9 inches. Okay. Now, somebody give me the number. And I'll go ahead and tell you, it's big. It's a big number. Three hundred seven thousand three hundred forty-six point four. Say it again. Three hundred. Three hundred seven thousand three hundred forty-six point four. Three o seven. Three o seven three forty-six. Yep. Point four. Yep. Okay. Do I have a second on the number? Yes. Now, how many times in structural analysis did we do uh, bending moment diagrams and we had values that big? We never drew moment diagrams that had numbers that big, right? That's a big moment. But the key is the units. What are the units for this answer? Inches. Mm, close. Square inches. Square inch. Nope. But you're, you're, let's, 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 let's sort of uh, 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 take this out. So our distance units are going to be in inches, and our force units are going to be in pounds, right? Now, moments are typically like foot kips, foot times kips, like a, a, the length times the force. So in this instance, it's going to be inch pounds. Okay? Moments are always in units of in, like a force times a distance. Remember, what is a, a moment? It's a force acting through a given distance. So does that make sense? Now, when did we ever do problems in structural analysis and we express moments in inch pounds? It never happened because the, in, in our world, if we were to express moments in inch pounds, the moment values would just be so enormously large that the, the numbers get to be a little nuts, uh, especially in Bridgeland, that you have you know, moments in the you know, millions or 10 millions would be crazy. So let's, let's scale this down a bit. Um, Let's start off, let's keep it simple. What would this answer be if it was in foot-pounds? How would I convert inch-pounds to foot-pounds? Divide by 12. It's the same thing if I've got this many inches, how many feet do I have? I just divide by 12. So what's that divided by 12? 
Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, what about now? Let's let's take it to put kits. Okay. So, if I were to uh, turn this into put kits, what would I do? Divide by a thousand. And so, if I divided this by a thousand, would it be something like twenty-five? We'll say 0.61 foot kits. Is that a fair assessment? So, in other words, we have a modulus of rupture of 474.3. ESI, we have a cracking moment of 25.6 foot kits, or 6 more. Everybody okay with that? Now, we, okay, so far so good. Okay, on this problem, I said that we were going to determine the cracking moment first. Um, there's a reason for that, okay? Let's go back to the problem, and I want somebody to look at the problem and tell me why would it be a good idea to compute the cracking moment first. Think about it. <clears throat> Let me ask it to you this way. How much moment are we putting on the beam? 25 foot kips. So if you put 25 foot kips on this beam, what can you tell me about the load on that beam? It's almost going to crack. It, it hadn't cracked yet, but it's, it's pretty close. Does that make sense? That, that's an important uh, 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 value to assess. So when you're computing stresses in concrete beams, one of the first things you have to ask is, hey, I have a beam, I'm putting moment on it, has the beam cracked or not? And the only way that you're going to know that is if you know how much moment it takes to crack the beam. So we have 25.61 uh, foot kips of moment that are required to begin cracking, and we're only applying 25 foot kips. So, so it's close, but it's not quite there. Now let me ask you a question. If I were to actually compute the tensile stress at the bottom of the beam, Tell me what you think it should be. Like just, you don't have to guess the number, but give me, give me like an idea. So the modulus of rupture is 474 PS, 0.3 PSI. So the modulus of rupture is 474. What can you tell me about what you think the stress on the bottom of the beam should be based on what we have on it? Is it going to be bigger than 474 or less than 474? Less. Less. But is it... Three? Like, is it 200? Again, the point I'm getting at is that it's less than 474, but not by much, right? We're just there. So if I compute the stress on the bottom of the beam, it's probably going to be something, it might be something like 471 or 468 or something like that. It's going to be close to 474, but not quite. Because we haven't quite got to the cracking moment yet. Does that make sense? Let's, let's do that. Okay, let's see what happens. So, so let's see the stress on the bottom of the beam. And so when I say stress at the bottom, all this is is just sigma equals my over i. That's all this is. It's just basic mechanics and materials. So we have our moment. Now, our applied moment is 25 foot kips. Now, I'm curious. We probably need to convert that into a set of units that would give us PSI, right? Now, can anybody think of a quick way of going from foot kips to inch pounds? 1,200 times 1,200. Not 1,200. 12,000. You're, you're, you're on the right track, yeah. But it'd be 12,000 because it's 1,000 to go from kips to pounds, and then 12 to go from feet to inches. So if we take this and multiply it by 12,000, or one way you can think about that is you can say um, 1 or, or 12,000 inch pounds over 1 foot kips. Because remember, whenever you do unit conversions, really what you're doing is just multiplying the expression by 1 with the appropriate context. because 
this quantity equals that quantity, and so anything divided by itself is 1. So it's, that's why it's equivalent. And so 25 times 12,000 is what? Three hundred thousand inch pounds. So therefore, uh, our stress, and we tend to use the letter F for stress in, in concrete design. So our tensile stress is M times Y over I. So that's three hundred thousand inch pounds times. 9 inches over 58.32 inches to the fourth. Got an answer? What? 462.9. 462.9 PSI. Do I have a second on that? So, first off, if we want, we can, you know, it, we might as well go ahead and do this, say, so, you know, that's our answer. And then, you know, that's our answer right here. Because the problem did ask for what's the cracking moment and what's the tensile stress. But look at your values. Okay, so this is 462.9 PSI. So again, it takes 25.6 foot kips of moment to crack it. We're putting 25, so we're right about there. It takes this much stress to crack it, and that's how much stress we have. We're right about there. Those ratios are going to be identical. Okay? Does that make sense? One of the things I do want to instill in you throughout this course is sort of to try and cultivate that engineering judgment. In other words, looking at those moments, you should be able to kind of calculate that stress and think, does that value make sense? In other words, if we had calculated this stress, and instead of 462.9, we got 183.6, that, that doesn't make sense, right? And what that means is that you hit a button wrong on your calculator, okay? And it's easy to do that with some of the formulas that we have in here. And so I really want you to sort of cultivate that gut feeling about, did, did, did I do that right? Did that, did that value make sense? Because that's really important uh, uh, in this course. Does that make sense? Sound good? All right. Now let's take this problem and make it more complicated. Because that, that's, that's what us engineers like to do. Okay, so now I have a problem that's a little more intricate. Okay, so I have this example here, and this example extends over um, uh, this extends over a couple different things. Because this is going to uh, reflect a, a, a homework problem that you have pretty closely. But uh, this example three has got a lot going on with it. Okay. So the first thing that, that you want to recognize right off the bat is I do not give you a rectangular beam. I've given you a T-shaped cross-section. T-shaped cross-sections are very, very common in reinforced concrete design. Remember, concrete is a material that behaves very, very well in compression, but behaves very poorly in tension. As a result, it's common in reinforced concrete design and in pre-stress design to develop cross-sections that put a lot of material up top. Okay, That's very common. Um, so T-sections are, are very common in... In, in, in our field. Now, what I've got is I've got a section. If the T beam shown below is uncracked, so we're not going to have to compute the cracking moment for this problem. We're going to assume that it is uncracked. We're going to ask ourselves what are the stresses in the top and bottom uh, if it's experiencing a positive bending moment of 80 foot hips. Okay. So to be perfectly honest, this actually really isn't even a concrete design problem. This is more of a uh, an engineering 216 problem, but. We actually draw upon Engineering 216 quite a bit in here, so it's really sort of meant to dust off all those, those skills that you learned probably like a year ago. Um, now, what we're then going to do with this problem is we're going to take the same cross-section 
We're going to get a little uh, 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 nuts with it. We're going to say, okay, now let's take this section and we're saying, okay, it's 3,000 PSI concrete. We're going to say it's normal weight concrete. We're going to ask ourselves, if we use this section for a beam that's 24 foot long, what's the maximum load that it could carry before it cracks? Okay, so that that is a very real type of assessment that a civil engineer would have to do, and it involves a lot of principles that we need to dust off in order to perform reinforced concrete designs. This is a really good couple problems for us to, uh, to exercise. Does that sound good? All right. One other thing I did want to point out um, before we begin, I said in the beginning that I am going to be very, very cognizant of the symbols that I use to represent certain distances, and so if I use a symbol, there's a reason for it because we're going to use that throughout the semester. So, for instance, this term here, this H sub F, you can think of this as the height of the flange. So, you concrete or you steel design folks you might remember we discussed, you know, with I beams that this would be the flange, and what would we call this? The web. And so, this is the base, the width of the web. We use B because it's like breadth. So, the breadth of the web. And this B is just the the width of the flange. We just use B here. Um, this di distance actually doesn't have a, a symbol in, in concrete design because we actually really don't use it very often for strength calculations, so I just called it 27 inches. Um, but uh, all those symbols are going to be symbols that we use throughout the semester. Sound good? All right. Now, what we have to assess with this problem, what makes it, I don't want to say unique or, or, or challenging, but it's this, it's this moment of inertia. Whoop. See, before, with our last problem, the moment of inertia, bless you, the moment of inertia was just BH cubed over 12, right? But with this, that's not going to be the case. We can't just say BH cubed over 12, and we can't just say, well, BH cubed over 12 for this rectangle and BH cubed for this rectangle. We have to compute the, the composite moment of inertia of the entire cross-section. So this is going to involve a calculation uh, using what's called the parallel axis theorem. You've done this before. I promise you've done this before uh, in, in deformables. Um, you might have been shown it a different way. So my way, I think, might be might take up a little more paper, but I think it's a, a little bit easier. So example three. Okay. Now, in order to compute the moment of inertia of a composite shape, we got to do a couple things first, okay? First thing that we've got to do is we usually split this up into simpler shapes. In other words, this T-beam is really just two rectangles, okay? You can split it up into as many shapes as you want. Usually you want to restrict that to a small number to make your math easier. So what we might do is we might say, okay, I've got a rectangle up here and a rectangle down here. Maybe we'll number them, like one and two. Okay? That's the first thing you're going to want to do. The second thing that you're going to want to do is you need to start your problem by picking a point of reference. The reason why that's important is because the first thing that we have to do is we have to compute the centroid. Remember the centroid, the sum of AY over A? And so in order to compute a centroid, you have to reference all of your distances from a common axis or a common datum. And so typically what I do to keep everything simple is I just say that my reference datum is the bottom. It doesn't really matter because ultimately we're going to sort of subtract the effect of where that datum is uh, here in a little bit. So you can put the datum on the top, on the bottom. It really doesn't matter because it's going to be a wash here in a second anyways. Uh, but you do need to pick a point of reference and you'll see why here in a second. Okay. Now... I'm going to draw a table, and it's going to have like seven columns. So in your notes, be aware of that. So make sure that you're giving yourself room for this. So we're going to have shape. And then this is how it's going to write. We're going to have the area. We're going to have the Y. We're going to have AY. We're going to have a centroidal moment of inertia, <clears throat> moment arm, and then we're going to have this. I'd like 
like I said, we're going to have a lot of columns. Now, how many uh, shapes does this cross-section have, or how many did we say it had? It has two. So I'm going to have a row for shape one and a row for shape two. And then here at the bottom, it's just going to be where I sum everything up. It's a pretty straightforward calculation. We're just going to take it one step at a time, uh, and basically one column at a time. So let's start off with the areas. What is the area of shape one? Three hundred, right? Simple, right? What is the area of shape two? Three twenty-four. Do I have a second on that? I heard. I heard somebody went. Mm -hmm. So three twenty-four plus three hundred. I think I can do that one in my head. That's six twenty-four. So far, so good. All right. Now the Y's. Okay. Let me explain what the Y's are. The Y's are the distances from the datum to the centroid of each individual shape. So I'm actually going to do number two first. How far is it from the datum to the center of that rectangle? Say it again. That is exactly correct. 13 and a half inches. So if that one is 13 and a half, what is the first one? 29 and a half. 29 and a half. Exactly right. Does that make sense? So for shape one, from the datum, we go up 27 and then go up half a five. So two and a half. 27 plus two and a half is 29.5. All right? So we've got the A's. we got the Y's. How do I do the AYs? That times that. That times that. So give me the first row. What is 300 times 29 and a half? 8850. 8850. Do I have a second on that? Shape two, what's 300 or 324 times 13 and a half? 4374. 4374. 4374 plus 8850 is what? 13224. 13224. So therefore, Y bar is 13. 224 cubic inches over 624 square inches because it's just the sum of AY over the sum of A's and that gives me what?
times 27 cubed over 12. But for shape 1, it's 60 times 5 cubed. So the, the number that's cubed is the one going up and down. So on shape 1, it's the tiny number. On shape 2, it's the big number. So got to, got to make sure you're using the right one. So you should get a somewhat smaller number for this one, bigger number here. So what do we got for shape 1? Is that shape one or shape two? Shape two. Always shape two. The bottom one. Yeah. Okay. What was that number? Um, Nineteen thousand six hundred and eighty-three. Okay. Okay. And that's just, yeah, that's one thing about these problems. Just I mean, you it, I, do it in whatever order you want and number the shapes whatever you want. Just make sure that you're doing your bookkeeping appropriately. All right. The, the uh, first shape, shape one. 625, do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay. All right. <coughs> Rocking and rolling. Next, next one is our D distances. So the reason that we need the D distances is because we're using this formula. This is the parallel axis theorem. Whenever you have a shape that is comprised of a bunch of simple shapes, like rectangles, triangles, circles, and even if it's not, this, you can trace this back to calculus and for any region. But for simple shapes, because uh, that's you know in practice what we're what we're dealing with, you can compute the moment of inertia of that composite shape by adding up that term for each simple shape. The moment of inertia plus a d squared. So we have the moment of inertia of each individual shape. We have the area of each individual shape. What are these d distances? Okay. Well, let's go back to our image up top. Would you agree that? This right here is probably going to be where y bar is. Something about like that, right? Because from here to here is 13 and a half. That's 27. So it's probably going to be somewhere in between. Do you agree with that? Okay. This distance, what these d distances are, is the distance from the centroid of each individual shape to the centroid of the whole thing. That's what these D distances are. They're basically moment arms. So let me ask you this. How would you calculate that distance right here? I'm asking you how would you do that? Now remember, this distance here, help me out, what is this distance? Y1 is 13.5 inches. So if y1 is 13.5 inches and y bar is 21.19, what's the distance between the two? Y bar minus y1, right? Just subtract the two, right? So what is y bar minus y1? So this one right here is 7.69. Would you agree with that? What that, uh oh, we've got a calculator. 21.19 minus 13.5? Now, this is good stuff. This, this is what we're here for. So, this, this one is 7.69. What's this one? How would you do that? So think about what we do. We took this number, I mean think, we took that number minus y bar, can we just take that one minus y bar? Isn't that where this value came, came from? So what would this one be? I'm asking you. Oh, sorry, I, put, I called that y1, that's y2. Sorry, this is y2. Sorry. Oh, it's going to be y1 minus y1? Exactly right. So what is that? A number. <laughs> it is a number. Is it bigger than a print? I'll try it. I'll try 8.31. 8.31. 
Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay, here we go. All right. Now, here's the thing. Notice how this is a big tabular calculation. Okay? Now, because it's a tabular calculation, what computer program would this work wonders for? Excel. There we go, Excel. Now, let me show you something. This, so this column right here can be computed as your individual Y minus the Y bar for the whole thing. Now, if you just tell Excel to do that, what's going to happen is that some of these numbers are going to be positive and some of them are going to be negative. Because some of the distances are above the centroid and some of them are below. Can't you does, does it really matter though? Can't you just do that to the value? Well, you could, but, but look at your next column. Does it matter? Oh, no. You're squaring it, so don't worry about it. It doesn't matter whether they're positive or negative because you're going to square it anyways. So, so it just doesn't matter. So don't get worried about that if you get positive or negative values because you won't, it won't mean anything in a second. So for each row, what is I plus AD squared? Doing good on time. We said 341.8. Is that what you said? Yeah. We'll just keep it to one okay. decimal place. And uh, that's good for this. What about the next one? numbers, add them up, what do you get? was just BH cubed over 12. For this problem, the gross moment of inertia is 60,184.9 inches to the fourth. So I'll sort of encapsulate that. Did you all do that? I assume you did that. It was either in statics or the formulas. I know when I taught the formula rules, we do that uh, right after our first exam, but I'm curious. You might have not done it this way. What you might have done is just written it out like it was one big formula. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm a tabular guy. I like breaking it up that way. I think it's a little easier to see and a little easier to diagnose when you're doing it by hand. I did. Good. I think that's the, that's the way to go. Is everybody good with this? Okay. So to be clear, we are, we are using the same methodology that we have done before. I mean, we're still using sigma equals my over i. Okay. Now, just to recap, just to remember how, uh, make sure that everybody remembers this. Can I borrow your uh, notebook real quick? Okay. So what we're doing is we're computing the bending stress in a beam. We take that beam and we bend it, right? And we're computing how much stress we get, you know, along the cross section. Now, we get zero bending stress in the middle, in the, but the real term, when I, I say the word middle, really what I mean is the centroid. The centroid is the location where I bend it, I get zero bending stress. Everything above the, the centroid is 
it being pushed on itself, so it's in compression. Everything below the centroid, it's experiencing tension. And that happens when you experience positive bending. I'm going to use the terms positive and negative bending. Thank you. I'm going to use the term positive and negative bending here quite a bit in this course. And so positive bending is when the beam wants to smile at you when it's being bent. So it, it, you know, it's sort of curving like this, so the top's in compression and the bottom's in tension. Negative bending is what happens when you have, you know, like here's a, here's a river, here's the water. Dr. Wake will make sure I put that on there. And then here's your bridge. Dr. Nas can say, where's the abutments? There's the abutments. And then I have them here in the middle, right? So in the main span, the bridge wants to smile, but across the pier, it wants to frown, wants to bend like this. So across the pier, that we call that negative bending. So that's when the beam wants to frown. And so in concrete design, that becomes really challenging because the top of the beam wants to crack, and that's where people drive. And you know, got to want to make sure that structurally, uh, that maintains structural integrity and, and all that. Okay. So, but we're using the same concept. We're going to say this is in positive bending. So we have our cross section. Um, let me make this a bit smaller because I'm just trying to illustrate what's going on here. So here's our cross section. Here's our cross section. And so the centroid we said is about like right here, something about like that. So. That's the centroid. If we draw our bending stress profile, everything that's above the centroid is experiencing compression. Everything below is experiencing tension. And so it sort of looks something like that. And remember, at the centroid is where it's zero, right? So the maximum compressive stress is going to be right here. The maximum tensile stress is going to be right here. That's the maximum tensile stress. Now remember, sigma equals my over i. So we've got our i figured out right here. We're going to need the moment figured out, which we have that that was given. It was 80 foot tips. But we need our y's. Now help me out. Pop quiz, what is this distance right here? There's no calculation. We actually already have that number. 21.19. So I'm going to say that that's my extreme fiber distance in tension. I'm calling it tension because it's positive bending. Now, it's 21.19 because we already computed it. That, that's where the centroid is. We define the centroid as from the bottom. So because we defined our data on the bottom, when we came up with that 21.19 number, it was measured from the bottom. Now that's why T, just to see if everybody's paying attention, what would YC be? How would we do that? If we know this distance, how do we get that? 32 minus that. Why 32? Because that's how the whole, how the whole thing is, 27 plus 5. So 27 plus 5 minus that is what? Ten point eight one inches. Does that sound good? Okay. Any questions? Uh, do I need to leave this up here for a sec before I move on to the next panel? Okay. All right. So real quick, and then we'll call it after this. So we'll say continue. So we have a moment of inertia of sixty thousand one eighty four point nine. We have a YC of 10.81 inches and a YT of 21.19 inches. Now, this problem said that the beam was subjected to a bending moment of 80 foot kips. Now, 80 foot kips, let's see if y'all remember. If, if I wanted to compute a stress, I ought to probably take that moment that's in foot kips and convert it into what? 
inch pounds. And what's a quick way of converting foot kips to inch pounds? Multiply by 12,000. So if I take 80 and multiply by 12,000, I get what? 960,000. Inch pounds, so therefore, our compressive stress at the top is going to be MYC, and our tensile stress at the bottom is MYT. So, a lot of the same values. It's that time of year, isn't it? Alright, so somebody help me out. What's our compressive stress going to be? Actually, let me put this over here. What's our compressive stress going to be? And what's our tensile stress going to be? And uh, tension? Remember, these are PSI. Because now we're looking at a stress. Remember, stresses are force per unit squared. So our force unit was pound, length unit was inches, so or force per length squared, PSI. Anybody got an answer for this one? I think you got outvoted. So, three, yeah, three thirty-eight point zero to round up. PSI. Did I have something written down? That's what I had. All right. A couple things to keep in mind. Now, what was our FR from the last example? It was like 474. So we, I mean, like if we were using 4 KSI concrete for this beam, which we're not, we're using 3, but if we were using 4, we could still hold more moment before we crack. So we're not quite, we're probably not at cracking stage. It depends on the concrete. Um, but that's just something to think about. Next time what we're going to do is we're going to take this section and these section properties. We're going to ask a different question. We're going to say, how much load could you put on this beam before it cracks? That's what we're going to do next time. And then after that, what we're going to do is um, we're going to start to investigate stage two. Stage two being, well, what happens if it cracks? Then what? Just because a beam cracks doesn't mean that's it. Beams can withstand moments far beyond their cracking moment. Like example uh, two, example two at a cracking moment of like 25 foot kips, its ultimate capacity is probably like 250. It's well higher than then it's a cracking moment. Because uh, remember, that's what steel's for. That's what the reinforcement is for. If you're not in steel, that's all I got. Great weekend. Um, one other thing, you have to turn in your homework. Over there. I got a file collected. That's all I got.